Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to February. Welcome to the second but yet coldest month of the year. And we're kind of experiencing that now. And as we go into this season, I just pray that God's presence is able to warm you through this. We're entering into a new teaching for the next eight weeks for February and March as we lead into Easter about what Jesus teaches us in the Old Testament. And what's important for us as we go into this conversation is to really understand the purpose of the Old Testament, and not only just the purpose of the Old Testament, but how the Old Testament will continue to teach us more about Jesus. We often think of a separation between who Jesus was in the New Testament and, and, and separate the Old Testament and say, no, that was, that was days past. We just need to focus on the New Testament now. And that's not always the case. So I want you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33 today. And as you open it up, I really want to introduce what we're, our conversation for today. Our conversation today is a really about discovering the glory of God. Discovering the glory of God. And so our goal today for KBC is to worship to that point. So the reason I'm up here after two songs is really to introduce how to receive the glory of God and how to work through that when he shows up. So we're going to be doing communion a little bit later on in the service. And for communion, again, similar to last time we did communion, we're going to invite you forward in an act of worship, and Marilyn and Sue will be holding uh, the juice, which represents the blood of Christ. And you're going to grab, with the tongs, a, a piece of pita bread. You're going to take that, and you're going to dip it in the, the juice, which represents, again, the blood of Christ. And you're going to take and really consume, through communion, the body and bread, bread of, blood of Christ. And we're going to continue in worship through that and experience the Spirit of God, which we'll discover today is represented as the glory of Christ or glory of God in the Old Testament. Chapter 33, verse 12. A story of Moses up on the Mount Sinai. He's up there by himself, and he's just come off of a, a real angry episode he just spent 40 days up on this mount previous, and God had given him what we know now as the Ten Commandments. These Ten Commandments, of course, within those are, you know, thou shalt not steal, don't kill me, don't sleep with my wife. Those are really important rules in today's society. You know, my, my, my thankfulness for the Ten Commandments, and, you know, even though somebody might want to kill me, they realize that's against the Ten Commandments. And, you know, go on with all of those Ten Commandments, because they all make sense. God is saying, I am God. Have no other gods before me. Pretty simple. Moses comes down off this mountain after receiving these Ten Commandments, and the people have already found another god, a golden calf. And Moses throws these Ten Commandments down and, and busts them to the ground. They, they just shatter. He goes back up on the mountain in this story, and he's like, God, I don't get it. You've given me this task of leading these people, and they don't even want to follow me. What's that all about? Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us. Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked. 
because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I, have mercy, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see my face and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the, in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Father, as we go into this conversation, may you speak life into us. May you speak your spirit into us. And God, as we go into a time of communion later, God, I pray that the conversation we have right now just leads directly into that communion. So that when we walk out of this place, we have been moved by you because we've been with your son, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, we've gone through this conversation, and it's the Old Testament we're talking about. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1-1, the idea that God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless. And then the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and creation began. The Spirit was involved in everything. Powerful force, enough to create everything we see. But human beings were distracted by the things that they desired. And from Cain and Abel to the place we are at now, we find ourselves far away from God at times. So far away from God that from the fall, the flood occurred. And from that flood, there was a sense that God needed to start over again. And from that start over point with eight new people, Abraham became Abraham who gave birth to, or who who conceded with Isaac, and then Isaac and Esau moved on to Jacob and Israel. Israel then had 12 sons. Among them was Joseph. Joseph has a dream, which leads him into slavery because his brothers were frustrated with that dream. In that situation... And Joseph found himself in a place where he thought he would be far from God, but because of his circumstances, found himself closer to God than anybody had been. From, from slavery, God brought Joseph to become the second most important person in all of Egypt. But through that journey, he did something special with Israel. That something special with Israel led God's people into a place where they had life in Egypt. That life in Egypt led to slavery. A lot of us know the story about Moses and the and and the story of Pharaoh. And because of all of this, Egypt ended up enslaving God's people. But God did something special. And through that special circumstances, God opened up the waters and brought us to the place we are now. Moses leading people through the wilderness. But God couldn't drag the people with him. Verse 12, Moses is up on this hill. He says, you've told me to lead these people. But I have no idea how. You will call on my name and they will follow? I don't quite understand. So let's go to Exodus chapter 33 for a second in verse 12. Verse 12 speaks these words, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know who you will send. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Reminds me of this story of Zacchaeus. 
Jesus is walking along and he sees Zacchaeus up in a, in a tree. Let's go ahead and read that story for just a second. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. This story is compelling to me because I think it's a story for each one of us to hear. And begin to see that we are all Zacchaeus. We are all people that God wants to lead. And I've got the wrong scripture verse. Oh, no. Somebody shout out where the story of Zacchaeus is quickly, and we'll come back to it, all right? Oh, my. Is it 19? Uh Uh-oh. I'm glad you guys have grace. It's Zacchaeus 19. I apologize. So it will not be up on the screen. Zacchaeus chapter, Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Put yourself in the story for just a second. And where I want you to see yourself is in the body of Zacchaeus. You got, sorry, a little bit of feedback going on. Yeah, well, you would get this. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man comes to seek and save what was lost. We are all in the same position as Zacchaeus. We are all in that place where Jesus does come near to us and we have a decision to make. Do we climb down, and spend time with him. Jesus' presence is showing up in this story in a powerful way, and it's the same presence that we see in Exodus chapter 13, or 33. We may not see it this way, but let's just look into this a little bit. If we just begin to picture Jesus in the Old Testament, and particularly Jesus in the stories We'll see over the next eight weeks that God really wants to teach us something about the presence of God, and potentially, it's always been Jesus. Jesus walking with every individual ever created. Verse 13 of chapter 33 says, If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is Your people, show me your intentions, God. Mental health is something that most of us struggle with in today's society. Bell Let's Talk Day reveals the idea that there are very few people that are separated from the struggle of mental health. We all have our struggles. We all have our lack of understanding of why we're even created. And sometimes that just directly shows our lack of understanding of who God is. I'm not correlating mental health with if you become a Christian, you'll never struggle with mental health because that's not the case at all. I personally struggle with the same issues that a lot of people talk about. And a lot of that comes down to my struggle with not knowing, and not just knowing who God is, but not knowing who I am, who I was created to be. Show me your intentions, Moses said. Verse 14 goes on to say, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. God has, to this point, always been known as the I am. When Moses first asked, God, who are you? He says, I am who I am. 
I am the Alpha and Omega, the, the beginning and the end. But yet, there's a lack of understanding of who you really are, God. And that leads to this lack of understanding that Moses has. So verse 15, Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I don't want to go. There's also a, something, a learning that we can also draw from this. Is I think a lot of the struggles we have in life is because we actually get ahead of God. We're so far ahead of God that we've almost forgotten about him. Verse 15 leads into this idea that we need to learn to not get ahead of God. I love what Moses says, I won't go with you unless your presence goes with us. Verse 17, skipping there, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Verse 18, Moses said, now show me your glory. So here's where the teaching about the presence of God begins. And this is, I think, one of the things we all have to learn how to ask God for. We want God in our lives, but we really don't know how to draw him into it sometimes. And I think Moses is in the same situation. Up to this point, God has been kind of periphery with him. And Moses is, first, is finally saying, I want you to show me who you really am, because all I know of you right now is the stuff I see in the periphery. I've seen your miracles, I've seen what you've done, but yet your people are still struggling to follow you. And I am included in that. Show me your glory. This word glory in the Hebrew would be kabod. A lot of scripture would also point to this idea of Shekinah. It's called Shekinah glory. This Shekinah glory is defined as something quite heavy. When you've actually heard some people talk about the Spirit of God, they say it's like a heavy presence in the room. It's like a feeling that you can't get over. It, it's, it's, you can't escape it. When the Spirit of God shows up, you can't escape it. Back in my youth ministry days, we went down to a place called Camp Shlack, uh, Shiktahak. i got to say that property whenever I say it. It's, it's Camp Shiktahak. And there's this building at Camp Shiktahak called Shekinah. It's where they go and have worship. And that's the first time I've ever heard this word Shekinah. And I was kind of wondering about that. And my youth were asking me, what does Shekinah mean? So I actually had to look up Shekinah. And it's the idea of the heavy presence of God. And it's the first time I'd ever worshipped in this place called Shekinah. But when we, oh, what I told the youth is I said, you know what we should do when we go into this place now knowing what Shekinah is? We need to allow God's spirit to work. And that night was one of the most amazing nights of worship I ever experienced because the Shekinah glory was present. The first time we see the glory of God, it's a powerful force. And here, you'll see part of the story is Moses' first experience of the glory of God. Show me your glory, verse 18 says. And the Lord says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. Think about that for a second. God's goodness passing in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And then he goes on to say something really interesting. Because at this point, we, all we know or all Moses knows of God is I am who God is. But then he sees a little bit of a glimpse of the vision of who God wants to be in people's lives. He begins to catch a little bit of a sense of the definition of God. God says these words, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will. I'm beginning to see there is a sense here that Moses knows who God is and I am, but has no idea where God is leading 
And then God says, I will. Beginning to, begin, beginning to see the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of who God is, the vision of who God is. And once he begins to understand that, something happens. Verse 20, but he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Interesting passage here. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on in this eight-week series. Going on to verse 21, then the Lord said, there is a place near where you may, here, near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory, when my kabod passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Let's pause on this verse for just a second. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of a rock. Interesting. Me, personally, physically, I'm really in control of my own body. When I want to move, I move. When I want to stay put, I stay put. God tells Moses, stand on this rock. And while you're standing on this rock, my presence will pass by you. And I am going to physically do something to you. I'm going to physically pick you up, and I'm going to move you into a place of protection. I'm going to move you into a cleft of a rock. And as my glory passes by, as I've said, if you see the glory, you will not be able to live. But as my glory passes by, I will pass all of my goodness by you, and I will protect you in a cleft of a rock. Here's the principle of the story. And I've shared this a few times with several different people. And I believe this with all of my heart. When the presence of God shows up in your life, you cannot help but be moved. Every Sunday when you show up at 10 o'clock, my prayer is that the presence of God will show up in this space, that Jesus will be here. And that when you walk out of this place, you become different people. In the New Testament, it talks about the disciples when they showed up in the upper room. They went in, but they came out different people. And the scriptures say that they became different people because they were with Jesus. And here's the principle. When the Spirit of God shows up in a room, you can't help but be changed. You can't help but be moved. When the Shekinah glory shows up, you are moved. Like Moses, not necessarily to a cleft of a rock, but you are moved either spiritually or physically. I think that's pretty powerful. The Old Testament continues beyond Moses. Again, with the ups and downs. We all know about the roller coaster that the Old Testament provides. But God's Spirit never gives up on the people. There is a moment in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Remember, I've told you the definition or the Hebrew word for this presence, this glory of God is this word kavod. There's this young boy, his name is Ichabod. Ichabod shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 4. What's happened in this is that as time has moved on, like we're fast forwarding quite a few years, God's presence is now defined by this Ark of the Covenant. Many of us have heard this. They would walk around with this Ark of the Covenant, and wherever the Ark of the Covenant would go, the glory of God was with them. He would actually show up in, 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 a, in a powerful light between two angels called cherubim. They were statues on top of this Ark of the Covenant. Picture this huge military uh, box, but yet fully covered in gold, actually made out of gold. And on top of it, these two cherubim, and between the cherubim was this thing called the atonement seat. God's presence in a ball of fire would show up in this space Underneath the cherubim, the wings were spread out such like this, two wings touching each other over top of this atonement seat. And God's presence would, 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 wherever the Ark of the Covenant would go, God's presence would go. The kabod would go. 
And people were touched by it and moved by it. If you touched it, you actually died. That's how powerful it was. But they lost the, Ichab- they lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines. And it goes off, and there's an interesting story I'll share with you guys next week about what happens when the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 21. Um, Phinehas has this boy. And his wife names this boy Ichabod. Remember, Kabod is the glory of God. She names this boy Ichabod. The Ark of the Covenant is now lost, which means the presence of God is gone. And Ichabod, his name means the glory of God has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God. The presence is gone. So here's the important part for all of us. We have to find in our own journey with God his presence. We all have to be the place that Moses was in, where he's standing on this rock, firm and secure, but with questions. And the questions we have lead to some of the struggles we have in our own lives. God, who are you? Moses asked that question. God answers him. Well, God, I really want you to show me who you are. I want you to show me your presence. I want you to show me your Shekinah glory. I want you to show me And God will answer that, just like he did with Moses, differently for each one of us. I don't know how you ask personally, yourself, but I know for myself personally, every morning when I wake up, I say, God, I'm here this morning another day. And I want you to show me your glory today. I want you to move me today. I don't want this day to be about me. I want this day to be about you. And I think that's what Moses is trying to say. Because today, I don't know where to go. You've told me to live this life, but I don't know how to live it. So we all need to be in that place like Moses was. I have no clue what you expect of me, God. But I want you to show me your glory today. I want you to show me how powerful you are. In about three or four minutes, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and we're going to invite you into a place where you have that opportunity to do that. And whether it's through communion or before communion or after communion, I just want you to get to the place where you say, God, I'm beginning to believe that I've never really experienced your presence, and I want to experience it today. Because when the Spirit of God shows up, you cannot help but be moved. I love the story of Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 38. Lazarus, being one of John's, or Jesus' best friends, is now been dead for the last three or four days. And there's a lot of sadness in the room. Jesus even finds himself weeping. Jesus approaches the tomb in John chapter 11, being the presence of God. Jesus is the kabod of God, the Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is present at the tomb of Lazarus. And he says, after weeping, in verse 38, he says, Jesus, once deeply moved, came to the tomb. So the presence of God is showing up at the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, and it's been four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. If you believed, you would see the glory of God. Picture Jesus saying that to you right now. That if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you. You have heard me. I know that you are always with me. But I said this for the benefit of people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
the glory of God speaks these words. The presence of God, Jesus, speaks these words. And he speaks these words into your own life. Put your name in the place of Lazarus. Brian, come out. Verse 44. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. When the Spirit of God shows up, you can't help but come to life. That's the presence of God. That's the kabod. You've got to know that he is present in your life, in this place. In every moment that you ask him to be present, he will always be there. He wants to be there. He wants to move you. But you have to be like Moses and allow it to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most powerful statements don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and the Spirit of God, the kavod of God, the presence of God lives in you and you just have to believe it. He lives in you. John chapter 14, verse 16. I know it's a lot of scripture, but I want to prove to you that God is the promise. And I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another counselor. He will give you another counselor to be with you. He lives in you, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him for he lives in you and will be with you. What did Jesus teach me in the Old Testament? This is the first of an eight-week series. What Jesus taught me in the Old Testament is this. That if I ask him to show up, he will move me physically or spiritually in a powerful way. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as I read this one last scripture verse. And then we're going to go into communion. Anne's going to lead you into that time. Marilyn and Sue will be here with the bowls of juice, which represent, again, his blood. You will dip and take and ask the presence of God to move you. The same presence of God that moved Lazarus out of the tomb, the same presence that rose Jesus from the grave, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And if the Spirit in whom who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. He'll move you through his Spirit who lives in you. Father, as we go into this time of communion, may it be a time that we are moved by you. God, we don't want to be Ichabod, where we lack your presence. We want to be the full Kabod. We want your presence, your glory to pass by in this moment right now, in every moment we ask you to. And we allow you to move us, both physically and spiritually, in a powerful way. Thank you, for Je Thank you Jesus, for teaching us this in the Old Testament.